Okay, um, so I'll get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. So my name is Mushfik Mubarak, and I'm a professor of economics at Yale University, and I do research on migration, and which is why I'm talking to you today. And we have two featured speakers today. So uh, Marika Clemens will go first. She's from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She works on migration along with uh, many other things as well. And Mahesh Shreshta, who's at the World Bank, um, he uh, works on migration and is, and is a co-author. So the way we'll do this is I will speak for the first 15 minutes and I'm happy to take questions as, as I go along and then I'll turn it over to Marika and then Mahesh uh, for 20 minutes each uh, to talk about specific um, topics. And yeah, so if you have questions as I'm speaking, please um, put them in the chat and uh, IGC events will help us, you know, we'll read them out and, and, and pause, pause, pause the speakers uh, or pause me when necessary. And then the two additional speakers, they'll actually take questions at the end of their respective talks. So with that introduction, uh, let me get started. Um, so we're going to be talking about migration and risk today. And why, uh, why these two particular words, what's the link between migration and risk is actually several different types of connections between these two concepts of migration and risk that have already been proposed in the literature. Okay. So the first one is that the environment um, that we are studying, say rural areas of developing countries, are often very risky environments, and I'll, ex I'll get into that deep in, a, in a bit of detail later. Okay. Now, so migration can actually be a risk mitigation strategy. So if you're facing weather risk in an agrarian area, right, one way you might want to diversify your income sources is by migrating. Right. So Marika will talk uh, about this in a lot more detail. She has done the primary research on this topic, and so I won't say more about that. And I should also say that this Rosenzweig start paper, that's another interesting example where uh, families in India sometimes, you know, what they find is that when they're in a more risky environment with more sort of rainfall fluctuations, then they are more likely to form connections with households that are farther away in environments where their rainfall shocks are less correlated than what the family faces at home, right? And so that's another way for you to form connections and mitigate risk. Okay. And second, um, migration itself is risky. And in fact, Mahesh's uh, lecture will focus on a lot on this. What are the risks for migration? And this is this um, idea has a very long history. Um, so ever since we started thinking about and modeling development, like processes of structural transformation and development, uh, uh, you know, the models often had uh, this feature that there was this modern sector or increasing transit scale sector that's in the urban area. And then there's a traditional sector like agriculture in the rural area and wages are higher in the urban area. So why do people choose to migrate or not? Uh, even the wages are higher, it might also come with risk. Right. So if you go back all the way to the work of Arthur Lewis, Harris, and Todaro, you'll see uh, you know, the risk of migration as a feature that explains the process of structural transformation. Okay. So Mahesh will talk about this. I won't say any more about that. And Mahesh's research in particular is about the risks to migrant health and mortality. Uh, okay, so, so you'll see you'll get 20 minutes each on these two topics. So the parts that I will cover more are the last three bullet points. Right? which is that um, you know, people are risk averse and risk aversion may itself prevent profitable migration. So now, instead of thinking about migration as risk mitigation, you might also wanna think about migration as an investment strategy, right? So just like you might adopt a technology in order to make yourself productive, one such technology may be the act of migration, right? Which is how I guess all three speakers today, um, none of, you know, all of whom, uh, all of us live in the United States, but none of whom um, are actually from here uh, originally, right? Uh, so Mahesh from Nepal, Marika, I think is from Holland and me from Bangladesh, right? Migration for us was an investment. Okay? Um, and so risk may actually mediate our decisions to, uh, to uh, in engage in that investment. And uh, another, um, and another link between migration risk is that migration can actually affect informal risk sharing. So one way that uh, one other institution or market people use for uh, mitigating risk or managing the risk is through informal risk sharing. The idea is that if Mahesh, Marika and I are all friends or we live in the same village, right? And if I'm going through a hard time, they'll help me out with the understanding in a future year. If they're going through a hard time, I'll help them out. Yeah? And and now you can imagine that the act of migration can actually have 
uh, can actually change our incentives to par participate in this informal sharing. So for example, if I migrate away and now I have a better outside opportunity that might undermine the risk sharing that happened in that village, right? And so migration may, even though it may be an investment in the household that's undertaking that act, it may have some spillover effects on the lives of others who live in that same community, right? Through this risk um, informal risk sharing channel, okay? And the converse may also be true, which is the fact that, you know, insurance markets are absent, which is why that informal risk sharing appeared, right? Um, so the fact that you actually get that uh, value from your community at home, that may deter migration, right? Which the idea is that, look, um, sure, I can migrate and I can earn a higher wage, but there's something else I need. I need insurance. I need to mitigate my risk and I need to manage my risk. And, um, and, and so if I migrate away, I, I'll take advantage of the higher wages, but on the other hand, I'll lose something of value, right? And so Munchen and Rosen's like the AER paper, uh, is about exactly this, this mechanism. Right? So, so there are many ways in which migration and risk are linked. So let me start by just describing an environment and then I'll get into uh, research, uh, the, like sort of, sort of scholarship and, and specific papers. Right? So we're talking about rural areas of developing countries and these are particularly risk prone environment. And the reason is that, you know, if you're in an agrarian economy, your main livelihood is from agriculture. Um, that is weather dependent, and you might be able, you might face large weather risk. Okay? So, how do people mitigate that risk? There are several markets at play, and if you you'll notice that each of these markets end up uh, 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 playing a large role in the development economics literature. Right. So, for example, how do you mitigate risk? One way is through credit markets. You, you know, uh, you borrow against uh, future income, uh, or through savings, which is if you save a past income, or could be informal risk sharing if there's no formal insurance, right? But you might also have access to some formal insurance markets or semi-formal insurance markets like Roscoe's. Um, and uh, the other, you know, beyond this sort of intertemporal smoothing, you know, through credit savings, et cetera, right? You could also think about spatial smoothing, like you could diversify your income sources. By that we mean migrating temporarily seasonality in a circular pattern, right? That may be another way to manage risk, which is if, the rainfall conditions at home are bad, then one way for me to mitigate that risk is I go somewhere else and find work, okay? All right, so that's all about, uh, you know, migration and risk, but we also have to keep in mind that beyond risk mitigation, there's another really important goal uh, in that society, which is generating investment and growth, right? And for that, we could migrate in search of better wages, or we may be in, in, interested in technology adoption. So the first thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is this question of technology adoption. So why is it, um, um, so, so what, you know, enables or deters new technology adoption, right? And the reason I want to pause and talk about this a little bit and maybe actually also get your, uh, get your ideas in order to make this a little bit more interactive and dynamic is that we often see, um, cases where there may be technologies or products or behaviors, right? I'm using the word technology in a, in a broad sense, right? So there's these uh, products, behaviors, technologies that may make our life better off. We think it makes our life better off, but sometimes we see that demand for such technologies is quite low, right? And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna talk about migration as one such example, right? That even though migration may be very profitable, a lot of people are not doing it. Right? So that's a failure of technology adoption, something deters it. Right? But there are many other such examples. So in health, there are good examples of, you know, there's research on bed nets. People don't adopt bed nets, even though it might make them healthier and more productive. People don't adopt improved cook stoves, even though that reduces acute respiratory infections from indoor air pollution and makes them more productive. Right? Uh, people may not adopt, and during the pandemic, we saw people may not adopt vaccines or masks. Right? even though we, we think it might be good for their health. Right? And but beyond health, there's also uh, you know, other domains like insurance, like you know, farmers in these environments are not buying insurance, right? say rainfall insurance or agricultural insurance, crop insurance, even though we think that that helps mitigate risk and that might be better for them. Okay? So let's now think about it and maybe you can use a chat window, I'll open that up, right? To, uh, so why, why do you think that is? So we have, uh, we have these, examples of products, technologies, uh, behaviors that we really believe in, right? Like the engineers or the doctors 
or economists or public health professionals to come up with it, right? Uh, they think like vaccines, they think that this is actually really good for people, but somehow we see lots of people are not, um, um, lots of people are not um, in, engaging in that, in that behavior, adopting that technology. So what do you think? Any, any ideas? And I'm also happy for, you know, if, uh, if you want to unmute, uh, maybe the host can allow us to do that and, and share your idea. Or use the chat. Okay, so if I were to ask you the question, okay, vaccines, the trials show are really beneficial, right? Improves your health. So why would, um, uh, okay, I'm seeing, sorry, I was in the chat window. I see that Q&A has some answers. Thank you. So let me, uh, okay, so we'll just do the Q&A. So let me read out uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing. So lack of knowledge about the technology, good. So there might be information failures, right? Mistrust of expert knowledge, right? And again, okay, so let me take, let me make a couple of comments on the first two answers I see from uh, Shabnaz and Sakina which are that there are information problems, right? But information problems, one is, you know, Shab Shabnaz's answer is that the information problem is just uh, like a very, very simple one, which is they just don't know, right? And then Sakina's answer is that they, there is an information problem. It's a bit more complicated because they might know, they might hear about it, right? But the relevance of the information source or the trust in that information, who provides that information, all of that, um, uh, all of that matters, okay? And um, and then you're talking about costs and benefits in the long run, that there are costs that are, Jose, Jose's answer, that there are costs that are, um, that are immediate, but the benefits come later, right? So that suggests something like a credit market failure, right? So think, you know, if you, if you can read uh, Jose's answer. Oh, by the way, um, um, I wonder if uh, like others, I mean, I'm seeing the answers. Can everybody else see the answers as well? If, you know, the host can just chat me. I, I just wanna make sure that I'm referring to things that everybody can see. Great, okay. So, so Jose's answer su suggests something like a uh, credit market failure, right? Which is that, you know, his answer is that, look, you know, a bed net, you know, I buy it or a cook stove, I buy it, I have to pay for it right now. And the benefits, like the health benefits accrue over a long time, okay? And so the problem is that I have to pay for it right now, but the benefits come later, right? So an economist's answer to that idea would be, oh, fine, that's fine. We know how to solve that, which is that if it's true that the benefits outweigh the cost, the long-term benefits outweigh the short-term cost, then people should be willing to take a loan, right? To pay for the good or technology. And then they pay off that loan on the basis of that long-term benefit in the future, right? So as long as the benefit uh, minus cost, the net benefits exceeds whatever interest you have to pay on that loan, then that would be the way to solve it, right? So if that's not working, then Jose's answer implies that there might, there might be a credit market failure, right? And then Christina says present bias procrastination. Yes, we might move, want to move outside of like a standard economics model and think about these behavioral issues. I might also add habits to that. People have a habit of a traditional behavior and not others, okay? Um, Social norms, Nursena's answer that yes, like sometimes uh, the decisions we make are mediated by what other people are doing, right? Uh, so masks may be very beneficial, like or perceived to be very beneficial, right? Or just because everybody around me is now wearing a mask and looks, look, they look down on me when I don't, right? Whereas if they don't look down on me and they don't make me feel bad, then I'm happy to go, to go unmasked. Okay? Uh, very good. Okay, so when I uh, uh, thank you for sharing all the answers, right? So, so there are, you know, all these, uh, I should have probably <laughs> moved forward in one of my slides, there are all these different uh, examples of such technologies, migration insurance, uh, also sanitation, like toilets, hand washing, and good agriculture example, new varieties of seeds, why don't farmers adopt new seeds? Why don't they adopt fertilizer? There's literature on all of this. Why don't they uh, adopt birth control? Okay. Now, when we ask these questions, um, these are the answers that often come up. And the most common answers I see in your chat that you share are like lack of money or, or a credit constraint or information failure. These two answers often come right at the top, okay? But there's also other things like you evolved or you share present bias preferences, habits, people may be risk averse, uh, taste and traditions. Uh, there may be substitute informal solutions. So when I was talking about take up of insurance, right? When I, if I'm trying to sell formal insurance, um, 
and I, I offer it to people at a uh, actually fair rate, okay? Um, you know, the person who is already informally insured, like remember the story between me, Mahesh and Mariake that we are helping each other out. Like somebody goes and offers Mahesh an insurance contract and it's actually fair. His reaction would be, wait, I, I, I already am partially insured, right? So I shouldn't buy your full insurance at full cost, right? Because like after I buy your insurance, then I won't be able to ask Marika and Mush for help anymore. But on the other hand, they're gonna be continue asking me for help. In fact, they might ask me for help even more often, right? In that case, that informal risk sharing can actually mediate the demand for formal insurance. Okay? Uh, and then in the cook stove case, right? It may be that, uh, you know, the person who cooks, they really find value in the technology. Like it's often women who are cooking in both South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? But they might not hold the purse string. So what happens is the person who's making the decision, say the husband is making the decision in the house, right? They may not find that problem of indoor air pollution exposure very salient, right? And then what happens is that, you know, we see the household not adopting and it seems puzzling because the cook stove is so good for the household's health. But once you think about who's making the decision and who's, uh, where the benefits and costs accrue person by person, then it doesn't seem as puzzling anymore. Right? So there are that's that category of possibilities as well. And then you talked about social norms, which I'm here calling strategic complementarities, right? Or social learning, externalities, et cetera, can also like people's decisions are interlinked. That could be another category of issues. Okay. So the reason why I brought this up is that look, this is a literature on migration and risk. So I'm going to focus a lot on risk aversion. Right. So nobody suggested that in the chat. So let me explain. Actually, I'll have some slides to explain why risk aversion may be related to and how it may be related to um, uh, technology adoption or, or the decision to migrate, okay? Um, so disentangling different reasons for adoption, you know, going through this list and figuring out what actually were, uh, what actually is the core underlying reason that we see the non-adoption is, uh, can be really important, right? And the reason is that, you know, sometimes if you're trying to solve the problem, we're trying to get bed nets to be taken up at large scale or cook stoves, or we're trying to sell insurance to farmers in rural areas of developing countries, right? We need to understand what the key of source of aversion is so that we can design our marketing and, um, and our policy correctly, right? Because otherwise we might end up wasting a lot of money. If it really is about, you know, for insurance, substitute informal solutions, uh, but then a lot of lot of you mentioned in, information issues. So if it's really about this, but then I try to target this by running information campaigns, I might end up wasting a lot of my time and money, right? Or I, I go in and start subsidizing people's adoption, right? That may work, but that again may not be the most cost effective thing to do, right? That's why this this uh, thinking through this matters, right? And so a lot of the research and the research that I'll cover will have this feature where you know, we might run a randomized control trial, right? Where we market a new product or behavior, whether it's insurance or opportunity to migrate, right? To a few thousand households and we can randomly vary different aspects of the marketing. Like, do you provide subsidies? Do you provide information? Do you try to target any other constraint, okay? And that way we learn what works best and we get to identify the key aversions to take up so that when this converts to policy and we try to promote that product or behavior that we target the right constraints, okay? So in this case, you know, randomization and large sample can help us understand these things systematically. Okay, um, okay so now uh, let, let me get into risk aversion in particular. Okay, so, so some products, behaviors, technologies that we want to sell are sometimes new, the cost and benefits of the product uh, to the user are uncertain, right? And so risk averse users may choose not to experiment with the product and that's the, that's the issue we face. Okay? And so I'm not, I'm not saying here like the product is bad or the expected net benefits are negative, right? The risk aversion issue is that in expectation, the technology carries positive net benefits to the user, but she still chooses not to experiment, right? So this is not a case where we're saying, oh, stoves don't get uh, taken up because it might change the taste of the food. And that's like a case where even though the stove is healthier, I don't like it because the net benefits are low, right? Or a bed net would be too hot on to sleep under. But the more interesting question is, look, I think the stove or bed net will actually make me better off overall, but I still prefer not to try it out, okay? So that's the type of thing we'll talk about with respect to risk aversion, deterring migration as investment, okay? Okay, so what, under what conditions is risk aversion most likely to be an important factor, okay? 
So one is when the uncertainty is individual specific, okay? And why does that matter? Because if the uncertainty is just general, right? Whether migration is a good strategy or not, whether the bed net works or not, or whether the uh, cook stove works for me or not, right? If it's this general and it's a common source of uncertainty, then you can just look at your neighbor's experience and figure out whether it works for you or not, right? In which case risk aversion shouldn't be much of a factor, okay? Uh, so, or by running a persuasive information campaign that just goes, uh, you know, public information campaign, everybody sees it, you'll, you'll, um, uh, you'll be able to address it that way, okay? Um, so, only, you know, so we should be thinking about cases where when there's individual specific uncertainty, right? So, in, my, in the case of migration, right, the risk, if, if the risk is just, oh, do I, will I find a job in the city, right? If, I, if the risk is general, right, and my neighbor's experience is really informative about what my experience is likely to be, then I just ask my neighbor who's gone to the city in the past, oh, did you go there? Where did you go? Did you find a job? If they did, we're done, right? Risk aversion shouldn't any longer be a factor. But if the issue is that my neighbor goes and he comes back and says, oh, I found a job, but on that basis, I can't really tell, look, look will my skills and my characteristics fare well at the destination? Right? If I don't, if I cannot infer that from my neighbor's experience, then it's still likely to be a factor. Okay? Second, it's more likely to be a factor when the down, the utility cost of downside risk is very large, right? So, and this is likely to be true when people are extremely poor, right? So essentially imagine that, imagine a utility function, well, you know, we know it's very steep at the origin or you could even put in a subsistence constraint, right? So then you have, you know, you're extremely poor, you're down to your last, $20, $40, right? Uh, and you're trying to survive, you need to feed your kids and whatever else they need. And then suddenly uh, somebody comes and says, oh, look, let me offer you this opportunity and it's gonna make your life a lot better. Okay, it could be a cook stove, it could be a bed net, it could be the act of migration. Like, let me, uh, let me connect you to a job in the city, right? And at that point you're like, okay, maybe I'll, okay, maybe I'll spend my, la you know, 10, 15 of the last $20 on buying a bus ticket to the city and going, okay? What if I don't find work there, right? And if I don't find work there and I come home empty-handed, then I'm really down to like, I've hit my subsistence constraint and now something awful might happen, right? In a situation like that, I might not be willing to experiment. Okay? So that's when risk aversion may prevent profitable migration, even though that might act of migration may be profitable in expectation, I might believe there's an 80, 90% chance I'll find work, but if there's a 10% chance that my kid will starve, then I might not be willing to do it, okay? So, so that's, that's another case where we really want, you know, might worry about risk aversion pre preventing profitable migration. And then that becomes like a poverty trap, which is there's this investment I can make in migration that will make my life better in expectation, but I can't even try it out, right? And that's what keeps me poor, okay? Um, and then the other place where risk aversion is likely to be factor is when insurance markets are incomplete or there's less informal insurance to help me mitigate the risk of, of investing in something new. Okay? So the specific context that I'll talk about here is, is work that I've been doing for the last 15 years on seasonal migration. And there's these pre-harvest lean seasons. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a picture to explain what's going on. So in Bangladesh, maybe actually, maybe just jump to this picture. So people, the main rice planting is in July, August, and the um, harvest is like December, January. So during July and December, January, there's work, like people are landless, but they supply their labor on other people's farm, right? There's demand for their labor, they earn wages, they're doing fine. But the pre-harvest period, right? You're just waiting for the crop to grow. So during this period, what happens is that uh, labor demand falls, wages fall, right? And uh, unfortunately, the price of rice that was in the last graph, the price of rice goes up, right? So this combination of high prices and low wages means that caloric intake falls. Right? So that's this problem of seasonal poverty or seasonal hunger. Right? Now it turns out it's a very old problem, like in uh, a paper published in Nature in 1884, also uh, looked at, you know, found patterns of uh, seasonality, right? Um, this, uh, and then in Bangladesh, uh, a population that was tracked in the 1970s, this is from 1972, uh, they find patterns of seasonality. And we've been looking at data, contemporary data from LSMS DHS surveys, where you can, like, you know, given that these surveys are large and different people are surveyed over the course of the year, some in January, some in March, some in August, right? You can look at patterns of like, do children's, um, you know, anthropometric measures, right? Do they vary seasonally? You, you see, yes, it does, right? 
uh, in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and also meals per day, this also varies seasonally. Okay. Um, so that all suggests, like if you do a back of the envelope calculation with all this data, it suggests that close to a billion people on Earth are facing seasonal poverty. Okay. And this problem might actually get even worse. So climate change, the changing climate might be making seasonality more acute in, in certain, certain places. Okay. okay, so why do we care about seasonality? Right? Before I talk about solutions involving migration, I want to give you some motivation as to why this matters, right? It's harmful for two reasons, okay? So one is the failure of consumption smoothing itself is directly harmful. So if there are missed meals or reduced portion sizes or people are not getting enough protein, right? For three months of the year, so children are staying malnourished, that's going to undermine their physical development, their cognitive development and may make them less productive in the long run, right? So that may lead to intergenerational transmission of poverty, okay? And then the second reason it uh, matters is uh, that that if you know sometimes when people are hungry they end up taking desperate measures right to address that hunger so like because I really need to eat something right now so what do they do so they you know this paper in the AR by Gunther Fink Kelsey Jack uh, Jack Massie they um, they show that people in Zambia right when out of desperation they just go work on other people's farms and leaving their farms untended. And that actually lowers their agricultural productivity and keeps them poor, right? And then Selim Guleshi has a paper in Bangladesh that suggests that, you know, people, you know, these are landless laborers, there's no work right now, they go to their employer and say, look, I'll come work for you for free in January, in January, like when the harvest is, right? Just give me something to eat now, please, okay? Now, of course, you know, that's a loan contract and there's an interest rate, implicit interest rate being charged and that and it shows that the implicit interest rate can be very, very high. Okay. And people may also just because they need to eat, they withhold investments that may reduce their future payoff. So they don't buy fertilizer when they should. Okay. Um, and then, you know, so how do you smooth consumption? We've already talked about like savings and credit, right? So you intertemporally smooth. The other way you can smooth is spatially, right? Which is that, okay, the situation is bad at home. So maybe I can migrate and send back home remittances, right? So there are these credit savings constraints that, that, that get in the way of intertemporal smoothing, right? But they might also be spatial frictions, right? That get in the way of um, spatial smoothing, right? So here I'll point out work by one of my colleagues here, Kevin Donovan and Wyatt Brooks, uh, where they built footbridges in Nicaragua and sh they show that trade frictions prevent access for some rural communities from like the price stability. Okay? And then we'll talk about migration frictions um, a lot more today. Okay? Okay, so in so let me um, let me tell you about this particular paper. So I'm presenting this paper with uh, Garrett Bryan and Shamal Choudhury, published in Econometrica in 2014. Right, and the paper will have the following outline that I'll quickly go through. Okay, so uh, number one, okay, is we'll show by running an experiment that seasonal seasonal migration produces very large returns. Right. So we can get people to take up migration when we offer them opportunities to migrate. And when they take it up, their family consumes a lot more, right? And then even more interestingly, like in future years, even with us, without us pushing further, they choose to remigrate. Okay. So that, you know, so I I'll show you the experimental results first. That leads to the question, okay, if this is so good, then why did we have to run this project? Why were people already not migrating? And here I'll go back to something we already talked about, which is, a model with risk aversion and individual specific uncertainty is sufficient to explain the set of experimental results that I'll show you. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about, okay, now how do we test the model? So the model is written to rationalize these findings. So we need to think about new tests. And here I'll talk a little bit about this and because now that if we are talking about um, risk aversion being an issue, then insurance should play, play a role. So we run some new insurance experiments in order to test the model. So I'll tell you a little bit about insurance because that's very linked to the uh, to topic of, of the lecture today on migration and risk. Okay. All right. And then we then do we do a full quantitative model and I'll tell you what we learned from that. All right. So the, the first thing is we have what was the experiment? So we basically ran this experiment where we randomly assigned some incentives for people to migrate in 2008 during that lean season that I talked about between like August, September, October, okay? So what we did was some randomly chosen villages, we identified random set of households and we offered them a grant, a conditional grant. Uh, it's like a CCT, conditional cash transfer, where the only condition is you should try out, like somebody from this household should migrate and try this out, okay? And, um, 
Um, so, so that's the only condition we're setting. We're not saying where you should go, who within the household should migrate, like how long they should stay, nothing, nothing like that. So just like try this out. If you travel, I'll just pay the cost. Okay. And then another set of villages, we offer the same, uh, uh, the same offer, except that it's a zero interest loan that has to be paid back rather than an outright grant. Okay. Now these two uh, interventions come along with some information, right, on where you could go, some general information on where people like to go, et cetera. So then we wanted to see if that has a separate effect. So we, in a third set of villages, we just provide that information without the money, okay, to separate that out. And then we have a control group where we're collecting data, but we're not running these interventions. Okay? And why this amount? Uh, it ultimately actually turns out to be, we added, like, at the destination, 200 more tacas, so about $11, because that covers a round-trip bus fare plus a few days of food. So we're just, like, trying to ensure the trip. Um, okay, and then what happened? So first thing that happens is that when you provide only information, right, it doesn't change anybody's behavior. 36% of people migrate here, 36% of people migrate here. But when you increase the, um, well, when you offer money, that's when migration rate increases to about 57 to 60%, right? So about a quarter of households can be induced to try this out. They choose to migrate in, in response to the, to the offer, okay? Second is that, so now that they're migrating and I have random variation migration, I can use that to study the effect of migration. And then what I see is that the families of migrants end up consuming 600 calories per person per day more. So consumption increases a lot at home. They move from two meals to three meals a day. They start eating more, they start consuming more protein and also switch into more desirable types of protein like getting it from fish and meat, et cetera, right? rather than dal. Um, and it's coming from the fact that they earn quite a bit and uh, relative to what they would have earned at home. And they, um, you know, they're, the migrant is taking care of himself at the, in the city, but they're also saving some of it and bringing it back home or remitting it back. Okay? And then the third result is that people start re-migrating. So in, in the next year, right, we tracked it again. And in those villages where we, off, where we had offered migration loans or grants a year before, Right, we see the migration rate remains significantly higher. It doesn't stay up at 60%, but about half the people that who we had induced choose to go back, right? And that still is true in like uh, in three years later, right? And then when you ask the question, okay, exactly why is it that, uh, yeah, like we ask over here, what were you doing, right? Why did you go back? And most of the people respond that they go back and find work with the exact same employer, right? So the employer just says, look, you've proven yourself to be a reliable worker, come back next year, you can have the same job. Okay. All right, so now the question is, right? The theory question is that, uh, why did we have to run this program? Okay. Uh, so why weren't households migrating to begin with? Okay, and so let me ask you a simple, yeah, a couple of simple yes, no questions. And I want to see, like maybe in the Q&A, you can just type your answer yes or no, right? So imagine that I offered you a lottery ticket, okay? And I say the lottery ticket costs about $10, okay? And, and I say to you, look, 80% uh, of the time, this lottery ticket will pay off, right? And when it, um, when it pays off, you'll get a huge return. You'll get like a 500% return. You'll get, you'll, or 400%, you get like $50 back, let's say, okay? And, but then 20% of the time, the lottery won't pay off. And, um, um, and then you'll just lose your $10, okay? So would you buy this lottery ticket? So you can just tell me yes or no in the Q&A. So the, again, the, the, the contract is, um, the ticket costs $10, right? And um, you, 80% of the time, you'll get back $50, 20% of the time, you'll, um, you'll get back, you'll get nothing back. So you lose $10. Okay, so I'm seeing overwhelming yeses, right? So, okay, so that's basically the, I mean, I, I chose those numbers carefully because it reflects, thank you for the answers. Yeah, so almost everybody's saying a yes, okay? Like 90% of people. So overwhelming answer is that, yeah, we should buy it. Yes, and that's probably the right answer um, depending on your, on your situation. Uh, but why I think it's the right answer, I would buy it. And the reason is that it's a really attractive lottery, right? 80% of the time I get a lot of money back. And I, so the expectations are, uh, the expected returns are quite high. Okay. All right. So now the people who, um, who, and especially people who answered and others, right? Let me, let me now give you a second scenario. All right. And that second scenario is, all right, 
Um, um, so yeah, if, if you can get rid of all the answers for now, because I'm going to ask a second question so people can respond again. Um, the second scenario is exact same lottery ticket, okay? It costs $10. 80% of the time, you'll get back $50. 20% of the time, you lose your money. But now I tell you, you're very poor. Your family is under the threat of, like, close to its subsistence constraint, under the threat of famine, right? Where, like, if you're a little bit poorer, right? Like, right now, you're barely surviving. But if you're a little bit poorer, maybe somebody won't have enough to eat in the family, okay? But still, it's still an attractive offer, which is 80% of the time, you will, um, you will get back $50, right? 20% of the time, you might lose your $10. But then with the $10, you're, you might hit your subsistence strength. Okay. So same lottery ticket, would you buy it now? So a lot of the answers, like now I'm getting mostly no's, right? So a lot of the answers have changed, right? So I'm, I haven't changed the attractiveness of the lottery. So basically, what's going on is you and I would buy that lottery ticket but somebody who's extremely poor would not, right? And that's the poverty trap, right? Okay? Now, another way I could have, um, I, I could have answered, oh yeah, and Kevin was saying no initially for that. Yeah, so, uh, so but, yeah, but like the first question, Kevin, I hope you're not in, in a situation where your family's under the threat of subsistence constraints, right? Um, uh, and so, so, so basically another way I could have ans asked the question to you is, um is like for for you and me right is like imagine it's a ticket that costs 10 million dollars okay and 80 percent of the time you'll get back 50 million but like 20 percent of the time you lose your 10 million would you buy that lottery ticket i i wouldn't right uh i wouldn't because um because like 10 million is way too much and that actually takes me below my subsistence right right uh so again depending on your situation and how much money you make right that you know, we may not buy that kind of a ticket and that's the kind of uh, situation that people are facing, okay? So now, um, yeah, so maybe what I'll do is, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just skip over the math, but basically the math gives you exactly that type of intuition, okay? Um, and so, so now, you know, what we do is, okay, if that's my, that's the model, right? So I just laid out the model, which is there's some individual specific uncertainty, that lottery ticket I was describing, that's that bus ticket, right? So if you buy that bus ticket, 80% of the chance it'll work out, you'll find work, but 20% chance you might find you might not find an employer who, who hires you and you come back home empty-handed and you're now down $10, right? So like th then we want to go and test in the data whether or not uh, features, other features of the data other than the non-experimental -ex results I already showed you as consistent with this model, right? So here, let me show you, maybe I'll just use this graph, okay? Let me show you what's going on. So, so the lighter color, the first bar, Right? That's the control group, no incentives. And the darker colors is the treatment group where you're providing the money to migrate. So note what happens on the x-axis, what I have is since I have all this caloric intake data, so I have detailed consumption modules and expenditure modules. So on the x-axis, what I have is the to your total expenditure that's just spent on food. Right. So when you have like greater than 95%, these are people who are very close to subsistence. Like they spend all of their money just on food and they don't have any money to spend on anything else. Okay? And so what you see is that look at um, the control group. In the control group, migration rates are lower, right? When people are very close to subsistence and it steadily increases, right? As you move to, uh, move away from your subsistence constraint. And then how does the treatment work? In the treatment group, this curve completely flattens out, right? There used to be a slope here and it's now flat. So what's going on is this treatment selects in the people who were not migrating because they were close to their subsistence constraint, right? So that's a feature of heterogeneity in the data that seemed very consistent with this particular model, okay? Um, and then another thing that you see in the data that's consistent is that, look, who are the types of people who are induced to migrate by our treatment? So the people who, um, you know, so what I'm doing here is I'm comparing control group migrants, right? This is, a, this is that group. So, so think about who the control group migrants are. They're regular migrants, they go anyway, right? And in the treatment group, when I talk about migrants, they're a combination of people who go anyway, plus people who are induced. So by looking at the difference in characteristics between people treat migrants in the treatment group versus migrants in the control group, I can see who we are inducing, what type of person. And the type of person we're inducing, if you look at this, 
okay? It are people who did not already know somebody at the destination. So people who did not have like a substitute form of insurance, right? Or people over here are people who, the people who we, who we induce, unlike the regular migrants, are people who, sorry, did not already have a job lead going in, right? That's this difference. Uh, yeah, so Sarah, good question. The incentives is uh, cash and credit, those two groups, not, not the information group. And the reason is the information group did, just didn't produce any effect whatsoever. So, um, so it's just incentives is actually the financial incentive. Okay. Um, yeah, but as you can tell, like since the information did not produce any effect whatsoever, like um, getting, it, uh, getting it out, uh, digging out doesn't make much of a difference. Okay. All right, another thing to, another way to look at like how risk ends up mediating people's decisions is like, um, yeah. So essentially, you know, what I'm doing is I have data on consumption and I'm plotting the distribution of consumption, but I'm doing the distribution, like imagine the distribution of consumption in the control group, the distribution of consumption in the treatment group, and I subtract one distribution from the other to see exactly what happens to the distribution of expenditures, right? Um, due to the treatment, okay? So what you see is a lot of people who were extremely poor, they move to being somewhat non-poor, okay? And this is in terms of um, like, yeah, this is in terms of Taka spend, okay? All right, so this is what seems like uh, in, in, our, in my actual treatment, it seems like, okay, look, this is doing, uh, doing better for exactly like extremely really poor people, right? But now what I can do is say, look, imagine that I did not offer the treatment, okay? So I take away that $8 or $10, right? So if I were to take away the $10 from people, this is what that distribution looks like, right? So now the, for 80% of people who it works out, they're doing better. They're moving from spending only 500 to 900 DACA to spending 1300, right? They move all the way out here. However, what's going on is there's a group of people who actually move to the left, right? The 20% the of people who failed, right? And this is the migration risk. This is what's preventing people from um, like what I was calling the subsistence constraint, right? So the data seems to, um, you know, uh, match, like these patterns in the data seem to match like the story that we were telling in the theory, okay? Um, and there is learning. So I'll say, uh, you know, what you see is the people who choose to re-migrate in 2009, a year later, right? Are the people who did better in the previous year. And you see that this relearning, this learning and moving on the basis of your performance last year, is true in the treatment group, but in the control group, your performance last year does not actually affect your decision to remigrate this year. So, so blue is people who choose to remigrate, so people who moved twice, 2008 and in 2009. Red is people who moved in 2008, but not in 2009, right? So in the control group, 2008 experience doesn't really matter. In the treatment group, the 2008 experience matters a lot. So it seems like we also induce people who had a lot to learn. Okay. Um, okay, and then finally, like uh, I'll I'll show you an experiment which tests this uh, this insurance idea because now I'm saying that look the reason why people weren't migrating is because they found it too risky so they needed insurance right um, and so like the way I ran the program as a as a grant or credit that wasn't the right way to run the program unless the credit was really limited liability which it was but like explicitly you might want to just make it insurance right so that's what i did i went back and ran it as an insurance program where i said look uh i'm going to you know offer you this money and if i land on measure rainfall in the city right and if it rains too much relative to historical averages, right? Because in Bangladesh, there's this flooding risk, right? If, the, if it rains too much in the city, then you don't, you, you only need to pay me back a little bit of money. Uh, you don't have to pay me back, but then if it rains the appropriate amount, then you have to pay me back and more because like to cover the insurance premium. So that's how I ran it. And what you see is that with insurance, right? That insurance contract leads to the exact same effect as the first year's loan contract. And in particular, Right. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, move ahead. I'll just say that the people, like I had to design the insurance contract on measuring rainfall in one particular city, right? In Bogura, in Bangladesh. And when I, uh, so when I look at people who were, who had a historical, you know, um, pro, uh, proclivity to travel to Bogura, right? For, for whom the insurance contract was very well designed they are the ones who react most strongly. Whereas 
uh, people who historically go to other places like Dhaka, they're not actually reacting as strongly to this insurance contract because for them, I've kind of introduced a basis risk. What's the basis risk? I'm measuring rainfall in Bogra. In Dhaka, the rainfall is different. My insurance contract is based on Bogra, right? Even though there's some correlation in the insurance contract, the rainfall is not going to be exactly, um, you know, perfectly correlated. So that introduces something called basis risk, which is the imperfection in the correlation between what I'm insuring versus what the migrant actually cares about. Okay. Okay, so now let me just um, let me just say uh, this is the last thing I'll say because we have four minutes uh, and I'll stop. So let me just say that um, we have, you know, so 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 once we ran this uh, project and we got these results, like people, some people got excited about um, donors got excited about oh maybe we should scale this up um, and because this seems to be a program that's working well, right? So my reaction to that was, look, I showed you these results on the basis of 2,000 people, right? Uh, a randomized control trial with 1,900 people, okay? Now, and we focused only on like tracking the economic, direct economic benefits accruing to the beneficiaries, the people who received the offers, right? Now, my, my reaction then was, look, but, but then if you start, instead of 2,000 people, if you start inducing 20,000 people or 200,000 people to migrate, right? The results may not look the same. And one reason they may not look the same is because at 20,000, at 20,000, that represents a large supply shock to the village economy, a large labor supply shock that might change the village economy and other people's lives will be affected. So those types of spillovers we should be measuring, right? So we, we need to take a broader, more comprehensive view of evaluation in that case. Now at the scale of 200,000, it might start stressing the absorptive capacity of the city. We need to also Start thinking about urban spillovers. So that's one dimension of uncertainty. Another dimension of uncertainty is that I'm, I was really just focused on economic effects, but there may be other non-economic effects as well, right? So, for example, if you induce lots of people to migrate, that might change relate in its men who is migrating. So it might change the relation between the husband and the wife. It might lead to more domestic violence. Um, it could lead to more divorce, etc. Right? The husband could lead to health effects if the husband's bringing diseases back to the village from the city, right? And we need to track all of that as well. So what we ended up doing for the next, you know, ten years is writing more, doing more and more research where we are, um, um, like tracking all these like general equilibrium effects and spillover effects. And just to, I'll, I'll, I'll point out in one minute, like what are the ways in which we track these spillover effects? Okay. So in the case of, um, say, what happens to the rural economy, we went back and re-ran re the experiment, but we changed the design. And the way we changed the design is that in some villages, we, we now go back and make those same, like, here's a migration subsidy offer. In some villages, we make the offer to only 10% of the eligible population, or actually something like 14% of the eligible population. Okay. Um, so, so. So 14% of landless households get these offers. In other villages, we make the same offer, but we make it to up to 70% of the eligible population. Okay? So the idea is that we're creating a big labor supply shock here, a small one here, and that's randomly varying. So I wanna see how does it affect the lives and choices of the people who don't receive offers here versus people who don't receive offers here, right? And then we have a control group. So we really have four, five types of people, the control group households, offered and non-offered households here, or offered and non-offered households there. So that's one way to get it. And then the second and the last thing I'll say is that this type of design can also help you understand risk sharing because what happens is that now that we are collecting data on others, right? We can see, you know, the, the concern I raised early in my talk, which is that sometimes uh, people uh, travel and, um, and, and as a result, you know, their re in, informal risk sharing relationships might start fraying. Okay. So we track that, we look at, okay, what happens to the correlation between income and consumption, right, uh, among all other households in the village. And so this is a, this is a paper co-authored with Melanie Morton, who's organizing this, uh, this course, uh, along with two other co-authors. And what we find is that, okay, so now let's think through the theory of what might happen. So one is, okay, look, informal resharing is imperfect. It's imperfect because we cannot write complete contracts, right? Why do, can we write complete contracts? Because first of all, there's moral hazard, right? You know, if I'm in a risk sharing network and I have this agreement that we'll share with each other, maybe each of us is like sharing, the act of sharing acts like a tax on each person, right? Therefore, each of us has, uh, has, a, has an incentive to undersupply effort, right? Relative to what the community would want. That's one issue. 
And so that needs to be monitored, right? And I may, might make moral hazard problems much worse by sending people out to migrate. Second, uh, there's also hidden income issues. Like sometimes people might claim that, oh, I didn't earn very much. And I might make that problem worse by sending people to migrate because now other people cannot track how much, how well they're doing, right? How they do in the city because I'm not there to monitor them, right? So those things might make risk sharing much worse, which is that, um, and then another thing that might happen is that the migrant is now better under autarky, right? They do better. They now have a better income earning opportunity in the city. So they become less interested in sharing risk with others. So to, to keep them interested, I need to let them keep a larger share of their income. Okay? So that those things might make others people in the village worse off. But on the other hand, what might make them better off is that now somebody, you know, maybe the risk sharing relationships don't fray and some people in my network now can go to the city and earn more money, and they, in in particular, they have, um, uh, they have an income generation source which is less correlated with my income generation source. So the less correlation should improve risk sharing outcomes, right? And so it could go both ways. So we, in the data, what we see is that when we offer people migration opportunities, it improves insurance for everybody else, right, by about forty percent. Right, so it was uh, on net, it actually turns out to be a good thing. Okay, okay. so let me just actually stop with that. And uh, yeah, I'm at 50 minutes, so let me stop. Uh, so Marika, um, would you like to take over? There we go. I think you guys can see and uh, hear me. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, for the introduction. Thanks very much uh, to the organizers. I'm very excited to be part of this uh, this course. Um, I think this uh, this presentation will follow very naturally on what uh, Professor Mubarak has been uh, uh, talking about. Um, this is a paper on the choice to migrate in an environment where people face uh, substantial risk as well as liquidity constraints. Um, so a couple of big picture numbers uh, we already saw from uh, uh, Professor Dean Yang's presentation a couple of weeks ago that about 3% of the world population are international migrants. And this number is quite a bit uh, larger if you look at internal migrants, so those moving within the borders of their country. Uh, as Professor Melody Morton mentioned, that's about 12% of the world population. Um, and in order to make sense out of these moves, most classical migration models treat a choice to migrate as a one-shot decision to the best location economically, and that's where people stay. Uh, but as uh, Professor Mubarak has already uh, 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 motivated, actual migration patterns are a lot more complex. Uh, we see lots of uh, people going back and forth, temporary migration, circular migration, a lot of rural, rural migration. And these patterns are not as easily understood in some of these, uh, these traditional frameworks. So in this paper, I go back to the very basic question of why is it that people migrate? Of course, many reasons that a person may want to do so, um, but there's two reasons that are often mentioned in a developing country context as reasons to migrate, and more broadly as ways that migration can contribute to the possible economic development. First one being that migration can be used as an exposed risk coping strategy. Um, so imagine a household being hit by a negative shock, an, an agricultural shock due to drought, for example. One of the ways to deal with that is to send a household member to another location to earn additional income, to make ends meet. Um, so this then predicts that uh, um, migration goes up after a negative income shock. Um, alternatively, and very much along the lines of what uh, uh, we just all uh, heard about, uh, migration can be seen as an investment strategy with the goal to increase or diversify future expected income. Um, but as with any investment uh, uh, that often requires large upfront cost, the migration cost, um, and if people are liquidity constrained, they may not be able to, uh, to, to cover these uh, costs as we already saw in, in, in Professor Mubarak's uh, uh, slides. Um, and in this case, it may actually be uh, a number of uh, positive income shocks that relax those liquidity constraints and then enable people to migrate. So both these strategies have been, been, been empirically observed, they've been carefully documented in the literature, but very much a separate phenomenon with separate sets, in separate sets of papers. Well, if you take them together, they do present a bit of a puzzle because we see the exact opposite migratory response to income shocks. Uh, uh, migration goes up after negative shocks in this exposed risk coping strategy uh, and after positive shocks as an investment strategy. And, 
Um, from a personal level, uh, what was particularly puzzling was on the one hand here, Professor Sambazi's paper, uh, where he looks at uh, uh, the migratory response to weather shocks in Indonesia and sees that uh, migration goes up. But then in that same context, Indonesia also using weather shock. Um, my paper here with uh, Jeremy McGruder actually sees a negative coefficient on these weather shocks. So at that point, I was like, oh boy, are we, are we just reading too much into these weather shocks? Um, or is there perhaps a, 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 can we make sense out of this? Is there perhaps a, a reason that we see these different patterns? And in particular in this case, my paper with Jeremy McRuder uh, looks at internal migration within Indonesia. We uh, very much follow Professor Munchi's uh, seminal work uh, uh, using uh, these rainfall shocks as an instrument for migration to look at effects of migration um, within Indonesia. Sambasi's paper, on the other hand, looks at migration out of Indonesia to the Middle East. And there you can imagine that precisely uh, people are liquidity constrained. That, that's something where these positive income shocks maybe really matter. Um, so, um, so, so can can I can I write on a model to make sense out of these two uh, diverging uh, uh, patterns? And that's what I what I aim to do here by developing a uh, migration model that incorporates both strategies, and that is dynamic in nature to allow uh, people to save up for migration over time. And then, as people re-optimize in each period, the model is a lot more flexible in allowing for multiple moves over time, as well as between multiple locations. So, sort of more flexible to incorporate some of these uh, diverse patterns that we uh, that we see empirically. I then take that model to the data uh, in Indonesia, um, uh, uh, where I have a panel of uh, 28-year panel for over 45,000 individuals using weather shocks that I show are predictive of income and wealth. So let me dive into the data uh, right away. Um, this is coming from the Indonesian Family Life Survey. Uh, you've heard it in previous lectures, including uh, uh, Professor Morton's lecture uh, at the start of this, this uh, migration module. Very exciting data set uh, and, and quite well suited for uh, migration studies because they've done an excellent job at tracking people over time. So there's low levels of attrition, which is important for migration as migrants tend to be the ones who retreat from the panel. And let me actually see if I can show here, um, I, I think you guys can see a, uh, a little uh, video now. Um, so um, uh, uh, what this is showing, that's really showing uh, the data as it is. Um, uh, uh, it's a 28 year panel, as I already mentioned, from 88 to 2015, um, over uh, 45,000 individuals age 16 and above. And every line that you see in the video from the green to the red dot is one move that I observe. There's about 20,000 such moves in these, uh, in these data. Um, and this is annual data from employment and, and migration, and it's picking up on moves that are at least six months in time. So it's not quite the seasonal migration that Professor Mubarak talked about. That tends to be uh, of maybe shorter in duration, uh, but, uh, but it does pick up on, 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 the, uh, on all types of moves beyond that, uh, mostly internal migration. You see sometimes Singapore and Malaysia uh, uh, picking up as well, but mostly this is um, internal migration. Um, so. Um, a couple of summary statistics here. Um, the migrant stock here is about 28%, so in about 28% of individual year pairs are people away from their, their home location where they grew up. Um, and then as a migrant flow, so where we actually only look at the, the years that people actually move, that's about 3%. Um, the median duration of each move is, is about four years. The average is a bit higher, so there's a, a longer right tail. Um, and we see, oh, let me get these, <laughs> these movers out of the way here. Um, and um, for distance, the average is, uh, oh, sorry, the median is 90 kilometers and the average is quite a bit higher, uh, above 200 kilometers. Most people migrate uh, alone, but if they do migrate together, they uh, migrate with 2.47 people on average. Okay. Um, the, uh, this is a sample area. And as I already mentioned, I mapped to that the, uh, uh, weather data, little grids here that come from the University of Delaware. Okay, um, so now let's think of a model that could make sense out of these, uh, these diverging patterns. Um, and that is dynamic in nature to allow uh, people to save up for migration over time. Um, and also just to, you know, because migration is inherently a, a, a forward looking uh, decision. Um, so um, uh, this, uh, this model builds uh, on, on Deaton's 1991 savings model. In that model, everybody has a certain amount of wealth, X, as a state variable. 
And then in each period, they receive a wage draw, W, and they decide based on it, uh, uh, the, the wealth and the, the wage draw that they have, they decide how much to save for the next period and how much to consume right now in order to smooth consumption over time and uh, maximize utility. So I take that model and I turn it into a migration model by adding uh, the current location L as an additional state variable. And that determines the weight distribution from which these wages are drawn. Um, and then I add as an additional control variable the choice uh, whether or not to migrate to another location L prime. Uh, the prime values here are the values for, uh, for the next uh, period. <clears throat> okay, so this is an infinite time horizon model whereby um, uh, uh, whereby each period looks uh, uh, looks as such. Uh, people start off with their state variables in location L and wealth X. Um, and then a wage draw will be revealed to them from the location where they are, from location L. And based on that, they have a choice to make. They can say either, okay, great, I'll accept this wage, um, or they can uh, try their luck elsewhere and migrate to another location where they know the distribution, but not yet the actual wage draw. If they decide to change location, they have to pay a migration cost M, that is a function of both where you start and where you end up. And then upon arriving, you uh, observe the wage draw from your new location L prime. You then receive that wage and you, uh, uh, and you choose your consumption in order to uh, sort of maximize your utility over time. And then uh, in the next period, we see an updating, uh, uh, you know, the, the next period state variables are then updated to L prime and X prime according to the uh, equations of motion. But let me first, uh, before I showed it in equation form, let me uh, dive into that uh, location variable uh, a little bit. Um, so imagine that there's a finite number of locations and every location is associated with a, uh, a wage distribution as well as a cost to get to that location. Now, from an economic point of view, there would be no reason to migrate to a location that is both more costly to get to and has worse wages. Um, so as long as people are migrating optimally, paying a higher cost must be associated with a higher weight gain. Um, so that insight then allows me to, to, to simplify things to uh, just a three location model. That's where I can get my, my basic predictions, whereby there's one home location. Uh, that's the location where you grew up, where you are at age 16, and I uh, restrict these to be rural locations, given the, the context with the weather shots. And then from home, um, you can uh, choose to migrate uh, either to a sort of low cost, low wage gain kind of location, or a high cost, high wage gain uh, uh, location. Now, if we assume that wage, that, um, uh, that, that migration costs increase with distance, as we would expect, um, and that it is more costly to live in uh, urban area than rural areas, you can think of that low cost option as a sort of nearby rural area and that higher cost option as a farther away city. <clears throat> okay, so then back to these, uh, these equations. I already mentioned the, uh, the equation of motion in this model is the evolution of wells. Uh, next period's wealth x prime is the, the wealth that you start with x minus what you decide to consume minus a potential migration cost that you may end up paying plus the wage draw that you receive from where you were multiplied by an interest rate and following uh, Deaton I model the liquidity constraint as a borrowing constraint that says that your wealth has to be uh, always quickly positive. So that then gives me the following Bellman equation, general setup, where we have our state variables here and our choices uh, for consumption and the next period's location right there. And I followed a paper that you've all just heard uh, a lot about, Brian Chowdhury Mubarak's paper uh, by choosing an isoelastic utility function uh, and follow another paper of Professor Mubarak uh, together with uh, 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 David Warren and, and Michael, uh, sorry, uh, David Lagakos, Michael Warren, <laughs> um, uh, by introducing a, a, a home bias. So this is a Y, it's, it's, it's sort of a disutility of being away from home. Uh, you can imagine that all else equal, you'd rather be at home. There's, there's you know, local knowledge, um, uh, uh, your mom's cooking, whatever it is, just preferences, family ties that, that, uh, that you would uh, prefer to be at home for. So I, I subtract that here as a, as a disutility if you're not at home. Okay, so um, there's no analytical solution, but I, I sold this numerically through uh, value function iteration. And let me just talk you through the, um, uh, through the intuition of the model. Um, so 
migration to this rural near kind of location, location wages are only slightly higher. So it's kind of like an extra draw from a similar distribution. Um, now you can imagine if you are at home, in your home location H, and you get a wage draw that's just so low that that you really just you know getting to your subsistence constraint, you really uh, 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 you know it's hard to make ends meet. You can imagine that you would uh, uh, just want to take that other draw uh, as 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 a strategy, which would only be a, a short term strategy just because the wages in this this rural nearby location aren't that much higher. Migration to the urban far kind of location, that's where you would want to stay, but you may be, uh, you may need to pay, you, you will have to pay a uh, larger migration costs that you may not be able to pay if you're liquidity constrained. And in that case, again, we can see uh, positive shocks uh, enabling people to migrate after which you would want to stay in those, those, those urban further away areas uh, precisely to continue benefiting from those higher wages there. Um, so let me take a look at the time. Yeah, let me very briefly talk, talk through the, uh, the, the uh, mechanics of the model. Um, uh, letting a model do its work. This is one realization. Uh, a person who starts at home uh, has a certain amount of wealth. And you sort of see over time, there's access, which are the wage draws, there's little uh, squares, which are the people's uh, uh, wages that they receive. And over time, these circles right here, this person is able to build up wealth up to a moment here in period 14, that the person has built up so much wealth that they are able to, uh, to pay for the cost to migrate to this urban location. They do so in a year that their wage draw at home was also a fairly bad wage draw, so they may as well go in that year. And it indeed seems that afterwards they sort of uh, uh, enjoy a, a slightly higher uh, uh, um, slightly higher wage draws. Um, Another realization would be somebody who's starting with the exact same starting values, but who gets some negative wage draws. And there may be moments when the person sort of has a, a wage draw low enough that they need to uh, hop to these, these rural nearby locations. And of course, you can also imagine a person who is not able to either build up enough wealth to go to the to the uh, to invest in migration, nor is able, uh, nor is 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 uh, uh, and doesn't need to go to 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 uh, to uh, the, the the exposed risk coping kind of migration. Okay, um, so empirically, I uh, um, uh, regress whether or not uh, a person migrates, person I year T, on weather shocks that I show are predictive of income and wealth in the following way. Uh, a drought right now reduces income, not surprisingly, and uh, a number of droughts over time in your past reduces your ability to accumulate wealth. So I then uh, regress uh, uh, the choice to migrate on this current drought at year T, as well as on drought in previous period, sort of indicative of this wealth. And that's when I see that flipping of the sign. That's when I see that uh, drought right now in this uh, period, in this year T uh, is positive. If you get a, a, a negative drought shock right now, you're more likely to migrate. While uh, uh, drought in previous years, indicative of this wealth channel, if you haven't had a drought that allowed you to build up wealth, and now you're more likely to migrate. So this is exactly the, the two, uh, so they've been described in separate papers, but you can actually see it here uh, within the same context, uh, uh, splitting it up here by, by these income and wealth shocks. Now looking at uh, the kinds of uh, migration that this may give rise to, I'm repeating here the, the previous, I didn't really, but these are just different time periods that I do. And I, I'm now taking this time period right here where I use previous shocks from T minus one, T minus three. Um, and I'm saying, okay, great, this is everybody. Let's look at the kinds of migration that this gives rise to. Um, first, comparing rural and urban, uh, we see that the, uh, the drought right now, it always encourages people to migrate, perhaps especially so to, to rural locations. But this investment channel, this, 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 uh, this accumulation of wealth is really what gets people more likely to go to urban areas. Similar is pattern we see for distance as well, that especially the, the previous wealth accumulation and the absence of droughts allow people to migrate. And similarly, if you look at shorter distance and uh, shorter duration and longer duration migration, we see a similar pattern uh, that the investment migration tends to, to work more so uh, in, in, um, um, uh, for, this, uh, for, the, for the longer types of moves. Let me, in the interest of time, um, uh, there's some results here uh, as a function of wealth as well. So sort of who is able to migrate, uh, showing that uh, some of these investment strategies are, are less uh, likely to be used by those with, with lower levels of wealth. 
So then to sum up, uh, we looked at uh, migration choice in an environment where people face risk and liquidity constraints, developed a model that allowed for these, these multiple moves and multiple, uh, 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 multiple locations. Um, and where empirically we saw evidence of, of uh, both kind of shocks within the same data set, both negative and positive shocks can induce migration. The ex post risk coping kind of uh, channel is more likely to lead to rural migration, nearby destinations, and use by uh, those with lower levels of wealth. <clears throat> Excuse me, and investment migration is more likely to involve uh, urban destinations and occur over longer distances and longer periods of time. Um, let me pass it over to, to Mahesh here. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them and maybe we can take them afterwards, um, uh, given the time. Let me stop sharing. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, let me put up my slides. Okay, so uh, in the initial poll that Mushfiq conducted uh, on why people might not take a profitable um, um, investment, um, there are a couple of responses that saying that because they don't know, they don't have the knowledge or information or experience, right? So I think uh, the stock is uh, going to be about uh, what, how, how people learn on a very specific uh, context. So the two papers that I'm going to talk about are listed here. They're also posted online already. So um, in case I don't manage to finish, or if you need more information, um, the, the, the papers are online. So I think, um, so we've seen this statistic quite a lot, that 3% of the world migrates. But if you look at this, um, GCC countries in the Gulf, six countries hosts about 11% of all migrants. Right. So, and then this is a relatively recent phenomenon. And if you look at like change in stock between 2000 and 2020, it's about a fifth uh, of migrants are, go to uh, this particular corridor. And this particular corridor, the numbers are probably an underestimate because these are temporary migrants that tend to be undercounted. In any case. And what do we hear about this particular corridor? Are these stories about um, uh, worker abuses, exploitation, and, and such. And it's not just uh, in the GCC countries, but uh, an, anywhere there is uh, this temporary irregular migration happening, you see similar stories, but the, the context is particularly that I'm going to talk about is going to be on the GCC countries. And uh, I think Mushfik summarized uh, quite well the, uh, the kind of risk that migrants face. There are employment-related uh, risks uh, that Mushfik talked about, that they, they might not get a job, it might not work out properly. And I think Dina um, in his talk mentioned a couple of other risks about uh, ability to switch jobs and such. Uh, but then there are other uh, risks that workers might care about, like the risks of physical abuse, particularly for women working within households as um, uh, maids and such, as well as workplace injury and accidents and deaths. Um, and particularly for these uh, last three in, the, in this list of abuse and accidents and deaths, it's really hard to have good data on the extent of these abuses and hard to have information uh, for the potential worker who is thinking about migration, but also for policymakers who, uh, who want to do something so the key question that I'm going to look at is, in absence of reliable data and information, how do workers um, uh, learn? So uh, what do they see? Well, how do they respond when uh, these risks are realized? And, and then uh, taking from there, is there scope for external intervention to fix uh, some of these market failures? And I'm going to look at a very particular specific form of risk, which is an extreme risk of death among migrant workers, and why deaths. Uh, mostly because of measurement issue, right? It's much easier to get data on deaths than, um, than on other, uh, other forms of abuses, but you can, you can think about um, similar forces being at play. So the context I'm gonna look at is um, Nepal, the people moving from Nepal. And if you look at this, India is a neighboring country and about 3% of the population of Nepal stays in India, and that's been roughly constant. But over the past uh, 20 years, you'll see a sharp uptick in migration to a destination outside India, and that's driven by countries in the Gulf, as well as Malaysia. And these are all um, driven by mostly male migration. Uh, they're temporary migration, so much larger time scale than um, what uh, Mushfiq presented in rural Bangladesh, but somewhat similar to what Marika, Marika presented in, in her setting in Indonesia. So it's, uh, uh, it's more or less two to three years is the median time, but people go multiple times. 
This migration process is heavily intermediate. So they don't uh, go on their own. There are uh, layers of recruitment agencies and independent local agents that work for these agencies who, uh, who sort of help them not just find workers, but arrange everything along the way of visa, travel, clearances, permits, and all the paperwork that is needed, which is quite a burdensome process. And these agents and uh, uh, manpower recruitment agencies, uh, they receive a cut out of the total fees that migrants pay. And in, in, in this context, there's a minimal pre-departure training and information session. It's mostly about uh, the basics of um, uh, what to prepare for, but it's very, very minimal. And one thing that is going to be important is that they need to obtain a permit uh, to work abroad, and then they need to obtain a mandatory life insurance uh, when they go on. So I think uh, the data that I use for the first paper is this permit database which I have data on every permit issued in the country from 2009 to 2013. And I um, get uh, when they left, um, where in Nepal are they from? Where are they going? And basic age, gender, contractual wages, fees, and their occupation. Similarly, on the debt side, the um, mandatory insurance, uh, sort of when a migrant dies abroad, there is a particular agency that help uh, the families um, repatriate uh, the bodies and then they collect data. On that. So I have a data on uh, in the same time period, all migrants uh, death that have occurred uh, abroad. And then here as well, I know uh, where they died, um, uh, where they are from in Nepal, um, and then the reported cause of death, which uh, is not super super informative in this context. So, and then I, for analysis, I, I aggregate them up into district destination cells. So you can think of a corridor as a particular district in Nepal going to a specific country in the Gulf or Malaysia, and we look at uh, what happens every month. So before I go into the analysis, just to give you some descriptive um, stuff on how bad the mortality rate is. It's about 6.5 per 10,000 worker per year. And just to benchmark, not for uh, not a causal comparison, in Nepal, if the same demographics had stayed in Nepal, the rate, uh, the mortality rate would be 23 per 10,000 workers. In the United States, it's about 14.4. And in Canada, it's about 8.2. So in an absolute sense, it's not huge. Uh, but what, what do workers think the actual risk is? Um, so when you actually ask uh, workers uh, who are about to leave, about what the mortality rate are likely to be, they think it's 139 per 10,000 workers. So massive risk than, than, than the reality. So this is uh, the empirical specification that I'm gonna use. So in these district destination month cells, I'm gonna control for all two way fix effects. And I'm gonna look at how death in specific origin district, destination country in a particular month affects outcome X months before or after the death happens. So these are the results. So we here I'm looking at what happens to migration to the same destination in this origin destination um, corridor, months before the death happen, happens and months after the death, death happens. So if you look at this particular diagram, in the so this vertical bar is when a death happens. So in the months before, you see absolutely nothing, but afterwards you'd see migration to that destination decline up to about 12 months. And what happens to migration to other destination? You will see slight substitution. So people, instead of going to Malaysia where death has happened, they go to Qatar, for example, and vice versa. There is some degree of substitution. And not just the same destination, uh, same district, what happens when um, to the neighbor? So uh, what happens when a migrant in a neighboring district dies in Qatar? Does, the, does my district see a response? Yes, there is some sort of spillover to neighboring uh, destination uh, and some substitution in the neighboring destination uh, as well. So on aggregate, what we do see is that migration falls about 1% per month for up to 12 months when one migrant dies in a particular corridor. Uh, 
And you see that effect from nearby neighbors, but not from uh, uh, far away neighbors. So uh, that's that's the context. I, I, uh, in the paper, I do look at whether there are other margins of response in, in terms of like whether wages changes or fees changes or occupation structure change. I, I see nothing. So all of these action is happening on whether people are migrating or not. So it, it shows that. Uh, so potential migrants are trying to learn about the risk uh, abroad, looking at uh, uh, these debts and treating them as signals, right? So, so how would an ideal migrant start? So like uh, what I demonstrate much uh, uh, in more depth in the paper is that the data is inconsistent with a water rational, a Bayesian updating rule would do. In short, a, a rational response would be the learning would happen quite quickly. Right, so the learning happens quite quickly, but here we do see uh, the and the magnitudes are quite different too. So we'll come back to that. So I think here the key problem is that death is a low low probability event and data is scarce. So learning is very difficult. So people tend to go into these learning fallacies, which are because they're using some heuristic updating rules to to respond when somebody dies. So I think the particular two particular um, sort of uh, models of these learning fallacies uh, are particularly relevant here, which is the law of small numbers where people are trying to infer based on the limited uh, number of signals that they see. And in this particular uh, setting um, or in, in this particular learning fallacies, Matt Rabin's uh, 2002 paper demonstrate that the sequences matter in which the signals arrive matter. So, and I look at I look at uh, how signals um, sequencing of these signals matter. So, to to look at it, so I look at streaks. So, in the past three months, if a death has happened in every single month, how do I respond? If there has been no deaths in the past three months, how would I respond? So, if there has been death streak in the past three months, the impacts are quite large. So, this is sort of follow on impacts. Uh, on, on the past three months, what happens in um, out migration in this month. So there is a lot of action happening here. The migration impacts are quite large. But if there is a streak of no deaths, so no death, deaths that happen in that corridor in the past three months, nothing happens. So not just that. So these are about streaks, the lagged effect of the streaks. But what happens now that one additional deaths has happened in the district? So even in in cells in which there has been no streaks, there is a negative effect. So no, uh, so no streaks in the past three months, but somebody dies. So the migration response is, is quite large. So up to like 1.62 percentage points, 2%, sorry. But in particular cells where there has been a streak of deaths in the past three months, the impact more than doubles. So I think the people are responding quite aggressively here. But in, in, in cells where there has been a streak of no deaths, so no deaths has happened, the effect pretty much cancels out. So the total effect is you need to add these two numbers, so it almost cancels out. So if there has been no streak, uh, a streak of no deaths, a single death, people just ignore it. Uh, there is no migration response. But if there has been a streak, and then additional deaths happen, people think it is terrible. Things are really, really bad and the migration response are more than doubles. So in, in, in that like people don't go. So it, it suggests that people are trying to uh, learn something and they're, they're responding. So I do a, an experiment in the same setting to see if people, if an externally provided information matters. Right. So uh, the setting is people are applying to passports uh, in Nepal. So at that time, all passports had to be applied in, in, in Nepal and there used to be a crowd every morning. So which provided the good, a good setting to provide this uh, information there. So amongst a, a, a pool of people um, who are applying and want to go to Gulf and Malaysia, uh, I randomly provide information about average wages that I'm not going to talk about today and deaths. So with so with one third probability, each potential migrant either gets no information that serves as a control group or a high information where I give a death toll from a district in the top 25th percentile or a low information where I tell them 
the death toll from a district in the bottom 25th percentile to the same destination that they want to go. And I elicit their expectations about how, how, um, how risky they think the destinations are. And I follow up with them three months later to see whether they have actually migrated. And the death information are very simple. Essentially, it's a one line of information saying last year, two individuals from Kathmandu, which is one of Nepal's 75 districts, died in Malaysia. And they are shown in form of uh, these cards. So what I find is that the low variant of the death, death information, where I say two people died as opposed to 10, which was the high, they reduced their expected mortality rates abroad. So the control group, as I showed you this very early on, they have extremely high perception of how risky the destination are. They come down. They don't completely come back to the normal, but they can't come down significantly. And then three months later, the same group of people who got this low death information are more likely to have migrated. So exactly in the setting, the default is that people think that the destinations are very risky. When I tell them that, uh, uh, give them some statistic, aggregate statistic, I don't tell them the rate, I told them the numbers I, when I tell them like, two migrants from your district has died in Qatar, they are uh, more likely to think that the destinations are less riskier than the control group and more likely to have migrated uh, three months down the road. So this is a setting where sort of, uh, you, you, can, you can see in an admin, using the administrative data, you can see that people are responding in, in large numbers, which is a large welfare consequence for a country like Nepal, where 20% um, where, like of the G GDP um, actually is, is remittances. So uh, all the debts combined together, the net welfare loss is about 0.2% uh, of the GDP which is massive welfare loss just because of this. And in experiment, what, what I show is that people respond to these um, information provided in the way they should. They correct their perception and they correct their behavior. Uh, and in, in the papers, I put together these two numbers and to, uh, to show that when even a single death happens, people massively overestimate their beliefs about how risky the destinations are. So this is to say that the way people learn is consistent with this uh, uh, behavioral policy and that has large welfare consequences. But a good thing in this setting is that uh, there is scope for policy uh, to change uh, their beliefs. And, and it's true in this context, people are also misinformed about wages and potential earnings, uh, unlike the context in rural Bangladesh that Mushfiq uh, presented in earlier part of the uh, talk today, um, particularly on mortality risk and uh, presumably in other forms of risk, people do need information and they do control, uh, sort of they do respond when somebody provides a credible source of information there. So thanks a lot. Let me see if there are any questions. Um, uh, I don't see anything in uh, anything new in terms of questions. So over to uh, Mushfiq uh, to conclude. Thank you. And if there are questions, I'm happy to uh, take them as they come in. Thanks. Uh, thank you both, Marika and Mahesh, for uh, for presenting, and thank you everybody for joining. So I won't uh, belabor things because it's exactly we're exactly on time. Um, and thank you both for staying staying on time as well. And, um, uh, you know, it was uh, great for us. And I'm sure uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I'm happy to hear from, uh, you know, younger researchers, uh, both graduate students as well as uh, faculty who are interested in migration research, uh, because, you know, this is a small community that both the three of us are a part of, but also Dean, Melanie, others who've organized this uh, meeting and who've lectured, we're all part of. And we're really happy to hear from researchers personally, happy to hear from researchers who might want to discuss their ideas. And uh, Marika and Myers, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone yeah. for, uh, for joining. Great. Yeah. And, and yeah, for, thanks, for organizing and for helping uh, and, and to the bread organization as well.